Hello everyone and I'm back. Today we will be covering gastrointestinal diseases in pediatric patients. We will be covering in this video high yield topics that show on step one, step two, NBME shelf exams. The reason why you should watch this video is that I gathered all information from different resources and I put them in one video. So if you watch this video and understand all these topics, I can assure you that you will do really, really good on your exam. Before we start, I would really appreciate if you guys hit the subscribe button and stay tuned for future videos. I'm going to keep making these high yield videos. So please hit the subscribe button, put a like, put a comment below. I would really, really appreciate it. So let's start. Usually when we get a patient, a, a neonate that comes with bilious vomiting, the way we evaluate these patients is first we look at them. Are they stable or are they unstable? If they are unstable, their vitals are unstable, um, they have low blood pressures, any signs of instability, we go straight to an emergency laparotomy. If the patients are stable, the next best step would be an abdominal x-ray. If in the abdominal x-ray we see free air in the abdomen, that also requires an emergency laparotomy. But if we find on an abdominal x-ray a double bubble sign that is a diagnosis of duodenal atresia. How about if we find on an abdominal x-ray dilated loops of bowel? So the next step that we do after finding dilated loops of bowel would be doing a rectal exam. If the rectum has an increased tone, that's when we do a contrast enema. A contrast enema will show us whether a microcolon, which is a very small, narrow colon, or a rectosigmoid transition zone. With a rectosigmoid transition zone, which means basically you have a dilated colon and then it like narrows down, we see it in Hirschsprung disease. Versus a microcolon, we see it in meconium ileus. And both of these diseases are associated with delayed meconium passage. We'll be discussing in more details about these two diseases. Let's start talking about meconium ileus. Usually infants pass meconium within the first 24 hours after birth. If there's a delay in that and the infant is having like bilious, emes uh, bilious emesis, we start suspecting whether meconium ileus or Hirschsprung disease. So meconium ileus is caused by blockage of the terminal ileum by thickened meconium and it has a high yield association with cystic fibrosis. Because we know that cystic fibrosis, with, which is a genetic disorder, leads to the accumulation of thick secretions in various organs, including gastrointestinal tract. So whenever we think meconium ileus, think delayed meconium, bilious vomiting, and cystic fibrosis. On the other hand, when we're talking about Hirschsprung disease, that usually results from failure of neural crust cells to migrate in the enteric nervous system. Patients with this disease present with poor feeding, abdominal distension, failure to pass meconium, and bilious vomiting. These patients experience what's called a squirt sign during a rectal exam. So basically, they, like, they have a squirt sign during a rectal exam, and that indicates that they have an increase in the rectal tone. When we perform a contrast enema on these patients, we see a transition zone between the narrow aganglionic segment and the normally innervated dilated colon. For a definitive diagnosis, we can do a rectal biopsy, which reveals an absence of ganglion cells. Of ganglion cells. And one of the most important associations with Hirschsprung disease is Down syndrome. So, when we think Hirschsprung disease, we think about delayed meconium, uh, bilious vomiting, squirt sign, absence of ganglion cells, and Down syndrome. Now let's talk about intestinal malrotation. Usually they present with bilious vomiting, but the way we approach patients differ if they, whether they are hemodynamically stable or unstable. If the neonates with suspected volvulus are hemodynamically stable, the next best step is an upper GI series. But if they are unstable, and they show signs of hypotension, tachycardia, peritoneal signs, which is like abdominal tenderness and distension, that 
requires an emergency laparotomy. During my PICU rotation, uh, we had a patient that removed their appendix. The attending told the mother to be aware for any signs of uh, severe intolerable abdominal pain, vomiting, and if that would have ever happened, take the patient straight to the ER. After we walked outside of the room, the attending pimped me and asked me, do you know why I asked that? And I was like, yes, because we're worried about adhesions. Basically, the most common risk factors for mild rotations are intestinal bands and adhesions, which usually happen after surgery. Now let's talk about duodenal atresia. Patients with duodenal atresia present with bilious vomiting. You should definitely know that the best imaging to diagnose duodenal atresia is usually an abdominal x-ray which reveals a double bubble sign. Let's talk about intussusception. Intussusception usually affects children between the age of 6 to 36 months. Basically, it's one part of the intestine that folds into another. They present with reoccurring abdominal pain episodes that last around like 15 to 20 minutes. They also present with vomiting and uh, that starts non-bilious, but it could possibly turn into uh, bilious vomiting due to bowel obstruction. And something they always love mentioning in the vignette is current jelly stool, which is basically blood and mucus, and that's caused by, uh, due to bowel wall ischemia. On physical exam, these patients might have abdominal tenderness and a sausage-shaped mass on the right side of their abdomen. Risk factors associated with intussusception are viral illnesses and rotavirus vaccinations. Ultrasound is an excellent imaging test to diagnose intussusception. We see a target sign, which indicates a telescoped bowel. For treatment of intussusception, we do an air or saline enema which is considered for both diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. How does this air enema help with interception? It helps it by pushing the telescope bowel back into its normal position. So whenever we, whenever we, we see or uh, talk about interception, we should always think of intermediate abdominal pain, current jelly stool, which is bloody stool, abdominal mass on physical exam, target sign and ultrasound, air or saline enema for diagnosis and treatment. Now let's talk about pyloric stenosis. Patients with pyloric stenosis usually present with projectile non-bilious vomiting after every feed. On physical exam, you find a palpable olive-shaped mass in the right upper quadrant. They also love testing on exams about the electrolyte abnormalities with patients with pyloric stenosis. So the electrolyte abnormalities are usually are decrease in chloride, dec decrease in potassium, and metabolic alkalosis. For treatment of pyloric stenosis, always, always do an in uh, rehydrate the patients and correct the electrolytes before performing any surgery. So pyloric stenosis, think of projectile, non-bilious vomiting, olive-shaped mess on physical exam, hypochloremia, hypokalemia, and metabolic alkalosis. Let's talk about celiac disease. So what is celiac disease? Basically, it's when your immune system reacts to gluten, which causes damage to the small intestine. This leads to many serious effects, such as impaired nutrient absorption. Symptoms of celiac disease are usually abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea, weight loss, but that's not always the case. Sometimes patients with celiac disease can present with fatigue and paler, and that's due to iron deficiency anemia that's caused by poor absorption of iron. So watch out for microcytosis and decreased ferritin levels in the question. Also another thing that's associated with celiac disease, uh, and we see, uh, we see in a lot of questions in the vignette, is dermatitis herpetiform which is usually located on the extensor surfaces, like your elbows, knees. With celiac disease, we find an elevated tissue transglutaminase IgA antibody. And it's also an important way to diagnose uh, celiac disease is through a duodenal biopsy, which reveals bilious atrophy and crypt hyperplasia. Treatment of celiac disease is to avoid gluten, and for like acute management of dermatitis herpetiform, we can give them Dapsone. So celiac disease, think about abdominal pain, bloating, fatigue, paler, iron deficiency, anemia, dermatitis herpetiform, 
elevated transglutaminase IgA biopsy showing um, villous atrophy and uh, crypt hyperplasia. Let's talk about neonatal jaundice. So we have two types of neonatal jaundice, whether it could be pathological or physiological. Physiological neonatal jaundice are always unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So they have elevated of their indirect bilirubin versus pathological or it could be either elevation in your in your indirect or direct bilirubin so unconjugated or unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia the onset of physiological jaundice is usually more than 24 hours after birth whereas pathologic neonatal jaundice the onset is usually less than 24 hours after birth. The cause of physiological uh, neonatal jaundice is usually due to hemolysis of the fetal hemoglobin. And that's because red blood cells usually have a shorter lifespan, around like 90 days. So that's gonna lead to increased uh, red blood cell turnover and decreased bilirubin. Another cause of physiological neonatal jaundice is uh, hepa hep hepatic bilirubin clearance is usually decreased in newborns because the activity of an enzyme called UGT, which is responsible for conjugating bilirubin, it doesn't reach uh, adult level until age like two weeks. So that's why we also see an increase in bilirubin. Now let's talk about necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a life-threatening condition that mainly affects premature and very low birth weight neonates, especially those uh, below 32 weeks of gestational age uh, and very low birth weight neonates that receive enteral feeds, especially formula milk. So keep an eye on the vignette, uh, what week the patient is presenting in, or their birth, what week they were born, and uh, what are their feeds. They present with the feeding intolerance, uh, increased abdominal girth, a bloody stool, vomiting. Uh, we usually find what's called pneumatosis intestinalis on imaging, which is basically leakage of bowel gas into the bowel wall. And that is the that is diagnostic for uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. So if we suspect intestinal perforation, which is pneumoperitoneum, which is free air under the diaphragm on x-ray, that requires a surgical intervention. The way we manage uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, it's managed by bowel rest, discontinuation of enteral feeds, gastric decompression and perineutral nutrition, broad spectrum antibiotics should be administered, but before we administer the antibiotics, we get a blood culture so we can guide our therapy. And if the patient is still unstable, or like becomes worse or we, uh, there's a perforation, then we need a surgical intervention such as a lip uh, liprotomy. So whenever we're thinking about nec uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, we think of premature babies less than 32 weeks, formula enteral feeds, uh, pneumatosis intestinalis on x-ray. Meckel's diverticulum. Meckel's diverticulum is caused by uh, partial remnants of the fetal vitellin duct which is an embryological structure that usually disappears in the first trimester, but when it doesn't, it leads to Meckel's diverticulum. What makes Meckel's diverticulum even more interesting is that it contains ectopic gastric mucosa. And this gastric mucosa secretes hydrochloric acid, which causes intestinal ulceration and bleeding. Unlike other gastrointestinal diseases, which cause diarrhea, vomiting, uh, abdominal pain, uh, these symptoms are actually uncommon in Meckel's diverticulum. So patients with Meckel's diverticulum present with chronic bleeding, which leads to paler and anemia over time. Their stools can range uh, from dark red uh, or maroon to black. The way we diagnose this is through a Technician 99M per technetate scan. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but AKA Meckel's scan which is a non-invasive test that's highly sensitive and specific. It identifies the presence of ectopic gastric tissue. So for Meckel's diverticulum, when uh, we should think of the age of the patient, which usually affects children age two years old, painless bloody stool, iron deficiency anemia, 
gastric tissue that's identified by technician 99M, aka Mackelskan. Biliary atresia. Anytime you see a neonate with jaundice, light colored stool, and direct hyperbilirubinemia, think about biliary atresia. Symptoms typically appear between two to eight weeks of age, presenting with jaundice and scleral icterus. The absence of normal stools, known as acolic stools, is a hallmark sign. This means that the bowel cannot reach the intestines. Labs with patients that have biliary atresia will show elevated in the direct bilirubin and uh, AST, ALT will be normal or mildly elevated. But the best step after suspecting biliary atresia is to get a right upper quadrant ultrasound to like get a better look at the biliary anatomy. So when we're thinking biliary atresia, think about jaundice, increased direct bilirubin, right upper quadrant ultrasound, to look at the biliary anatomy. So our last topic, we're, we're going to be talking about inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn disease versus ulcerative colitis. With Crohn, it could happen anywhere from the mouth to the anus, but it specifically uh, or most commonly affects the ileum and the colon. It usually, with Crohn disease, the rectum is spared and you do have skip lesions. Whereas ulcerative col colitis, you do have involvement of the rectum and colon, it's only involvement of the rectum and colon, and you do have continuous lesions. On microscope, with Crohn disease, you, you find non-cassating granuloma, whereas for ulcerative colitis, you see uh, no granulomas. Crohn disease has transmu transmural inflammation, whereas ulcerative colitis has mucosal and submucosal inflammation. Crohn disease, you have linear mucosal ulceration, cobblestoning, creeping fat, whereas ulcerative colitis, you have pseudopolyps. The clinical presentations for Crohn disease are usually abdominal pain and uh, mainly in the right lower quadrant, and they could have watery diarrhea, maybe sometimes bloody. Ulcerative colitis, they can have abdominal pain, it could be anywhere and they do have bloody diarrhea. Some intestinal complications for Crohn disease are uh, fistula, abscesses, strictures, whereas ulcerative colitis, you do have a, a complication would be toxic megacolon. And there you have it, guys. This is the end of the video. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope this was helpful. If you guys have any questions, please comment down below. Give this video a like, and please, please subscribe and help this channel grow. Thank you guys so much.